successive cycles, they have six people filed. Being on the ballot.
Thank you. All right, I'm going to call this uh, work session to order. Our first item up is the annual arts committee uh, review. And uh, Jordan is going to get us kicked off. Great. Thanks. Um, let me just share my screen with you real quick. And uh, Hamid's going to be with me today, too. And um, we'll kind of split up uh, part of the presentation. So um, you'll get a chance to hear from him as well. Cool. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening to us today. Normally we give this update in uh, April, but um, it's actually kind of nice giving it a little bit later because we get to talk about some of the summer activities that the Arts Committee has been doing that um, we haven't really been able to share before. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, just to start off with, this is the Arts Committee's current um, roster of members. Um, and right now, Hamid is the chair with Alicia Hamilton as the vice chair and Samantha Swindler is the secretary and Julie Radcliffe is the treasurer. Sorry, I didn't highlight her name. But you can see that one. Um, and uh, we recently got four new members um, a couple months ago. Um, so that's been an interesting transition, just uh, onboarding new members in the time of COVID and uh, kind of being the first meeting as like a Zoom meeting. But um, I think everyone's been working pretty well. Um, and the Arts Committee has been communicating really well with each other, so um, everything's going well in that regard. Um, just going to move on to the goals that the committee set. This is what they um, came up with in February of this year, um, before coronavirus hit. Um, they're a little bit, they're a little similar to the goals last year, but with some added emphasis. Um, so the first goal was to raise awareness of the Arts Committee, and um, a lot of that right now has obviously been focused on creating a bigger web presence and uh, doing a lot more with social media. And um, we're even going to be hosting some events through uh, social media and virtual um, tools. And so you'll hear about that from Hamid a little bit later. But um, yeah, a lot of emphasis on that. And, um, and also just developing a lot of partnerships within the community. And um, a, a few of those have been kind of put on hold, but it's also given the Arts Committee an opportunity to create some more relationships and stronger relationships with people like the Chapel Theater and some of the neighborhoods. Um, so that one's been going really well. Uh, for establishing the City Hall, or for the Arts Committee identity, um, a lot of that's continuing the artist series um, and the sculptures, murals, things like that. And then um, finding a way to expand some of the other art forms, like written or performing arts. Um, and the last goal is creating a sustainable funding stream. And um, the primary way that the Arts Committee was hoping to do that is uh, creating a foundation so um, they can apply for more grants and things like that. But then also um, being a lot more diligent uh, for collecting commissions and things like that. And um, finding some other ways to just uh, either fundraise or um, apply for grants that the, the committee would be eligible for. And, um, and also uh, we've taken a little bit more of a firmer stance on establishing or maintaining the budget and um, the city is actually maintaining the arts committee's uh, account right now and so um there's a little more transparency and more accountability and um and julie's doing a really good job uh making sure we're on top of everything and we have all the paperwork and everything like that so it's a uh, very helpful right now um so we're just going to move on to some of the stuff we've been doing some of the more exciting things that's been going on lately um so first up we have uh which uh, a city hall gallery with Gabe Storm, and it I've, we felt really bad because Gabe basically installed his show about a day or two before everything shut down. So all of his work is up in city hall. If you ever want to take a look at it, just nobody else really can besides somebody who has access to city hall. But Hamid did a really good job of uh, doing an interview with Gabe, and so we sort of had like a virtual gallery tour that was promoted a few months back, and. Um, got to hear from Gabe and hear all about his inspiration and see all of his work up in City Hall. So I, I think that th that's been great. You know, we all kind of felt bad that, you know, it wasn't like a first Friday where people could come in and everything like that. But um, the, the interview, I think, went really well. And um, I think Gabe still had fun with it. And um, it's been kind of nice, too, because uh, other staff members have said, hey, it's actually kind of nice seeing up all of Gabe's work that he did for Milwaukee anyway. It almost seems kind of like it could be like a permanent exhibit. But um, so it's nice that it's sort of timeless and uh, yeah, can stay up in City Hall for a while and, and at least you know we can enjoy it for a while and hopefully the public can too soon. Um, 
And uh, I'll turn it over to Hamid to talk about um, our partnership with Chapel Theater and performing series there. Yeah, howdy y'all. So our second annual performance series at Chapel Theater uh, got cut short by two thirds. We were able to do our first event with Bridge City Improv and then the next month COVID hit. So everything changed. Um, it took a while for us to find our footing, but uh, we eventually did. And we offered our second month a little bit later in July. And we had the Red Yarn, uh, which is more of a like a kid family friendly uh, event with guitars and puppets. Uh, and so we did that online and had a nice little turnout there in the virtual world. Uh, our third event uh, has been put off quite a bit longer as we've tried to figure this out, but we're still going to do a dance and wine pairing um, and we're going to do it virtually. So what's going to happen is uh, the choreographers and the performers are going to film their pieces um, and then folks will be able to go to some local establishments and purchase uh, a, a pack of different wines. And uh, so there'll be four different performances paired with four different wines. So you'll get a, a bottle of wine per performance and everyone will be encouraged to uh, drink, drink some wine when they're watching the performance online. Uh, so that's how we're gonna try and do that in this COVID world. Um, and that'll be in October. Thanks, Amin. Um, yeah. And uh, let you talk about this as well. Sure. Uh, Hearts in Parks. This was a uh, this was a takeoff of the phenomenon that is Hidden Hearts Milwaukee, which is a Facebook group, and now they have an Instagram presence as well. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a whole lot of hearts being put up in people's windows and doors and on mailboxes and on sidewalks and just about everywhere in Milwaukee. Well, NCPRD, our dear friends there, noticed this and uh, asked us to do a collaboration to tie into Hidden Hearts Milwaukee. And we came up with the idea of Hearts in Parks. So hashtag Hearts in Parks. So NCPRD paid for and put together a half a dozen chalk kits, which uh, you can see in one of the pictures there, uh, foldable picnic baskets and inside were, uh, you, you got a, uh, a, a water bottle and a disposable mask and a pair of cool sunglasses and a, uh, and a bundle of chalk. And we had decided on getting vibrant pastel chalk. So they really, the colors really pop on the sidewalk. And we gave these out to different folks in the community, different artists and, and just folks in the community who wanted to be creative. And we encouraged them to create heart art in different parks uh, managed by NCPRD. And so we've had a handful of artists uh, occasionally they'll go out on a morning and make some art. Um, and actually, NCPRD is putting together another half dozen chalk kits, which I'll go pick up sometime very, very soon. Um, so that's been a really fun project to get. Uh, you just want to get folks creative in all sorts of ways and throw up art everywhere around the city, uh, sometimes in unexpected places. Uh, so that's what's going on there with Hearts and Parks. Um, that takes us to the mural, and this is uh, this was start. We kind of got the process rolling with Joe. Um, I don't know. It seemed like almost a year ago, he first approached the arts committee. But um, after a couple locations fell through, and uh, we finally got a, a location settled with Chan Stakery, and um, we actually did the final review yesterday, and it's all complete. And so um, this is a pretty unique one, and it was actually. Uh, Kind of a big benefit that the, one of the locations fell through and, and it ended up on chance was because uh, we got to do a, a two-sided mural which i don't think we see too often it's pretty unique um so one side faces mclaughlin and uh, one side faces main street um and if you uh haven't seen it yet here's the side that uh faces mclaughlin and um that side is kind of a and it almost seems like the 
part of a, an octagon or something because uh, there's three sides there actually and uh, um, yeah sort of wraps around the building there and so you get some pretty cool scenes but he did a really nice job making it look like one continuous image and then um, we uh, and thanks to Kelly and Julian uh, we got ODOT to come and trim the trees too so you can actually see the mural now from <laughs> McLaughlin which is really nice um, and here's the side uh, that faces Main Street and um, and it's been really interesting to kind of see how uh, the murals affected Chans too because um, Joe was telling us about how after he started painting and they started getting some more business and realized how much of a kind of a draw the mural has been they they've decided to start remodeling things um, they're rethinking like how they're going to do the banners uh, you can kind of see one on the left side where they flipped up the banner but they're going to be replacing them with much smaller banners and um, trying to do a little bit more uh, I guess tasteful or, or not maybe not uh, just kind of and work with the mural a little bit better um, the mural has been really great too because uh, Joe was telling you know Joe was a little struggling a bit you know after coronavirus hit and um, not really being able to to do as much work or like show in different fairs and markets and things like that but um, because he did them um, and thanks to the members of the committee who reached out to the media and, and set up some interviews uh, he got some really nice exposure and he said he's already gotten four more job offers from doing this and um, really helped him and his family which we love that that's you know the results and um, and also you know just how grateful Chans has been like they've told him so many times about how you know how happy they've been with the mural and glad that this you know the city helped facilitate this with the arts committee and that there was funding for this and um, yeah it's just been really great and it's been nice too that it's you know one of the activities you can also do during this time because painting all by yourself is very much social distancing and um, you know something that can still continue so um, yeah it's a uh, yeah, really nice uh, catalyst project and uh, since that um, we've actually received four more mural applications for different spots um, some people don't know where they you know where they would like to put a mural but they're reaching out saying I can do this and I would really love to create something in Milwaukee can you please help us you know connect with a, a property <laughs> owner so we can get it going um, and the next mural is going to be one from Jeremy Davis and uh, if you remember him he's did the port really amazing portrait of Florence Letting in the new library and um, this one is scheduled or planned to go on uh, the water reservoir tank at 40th and Harvey and um, it'll wrap around a bit but it'll face more um, the the houses on the on the right hand side rather than like this sort of corner but you can still see it from the intersection and probably water tower park because it's going to be uh, like it says there, like 25 feet wide and 15 and a half feet tall so it'll be big um, and from his sketch, this is uh, one of the more recent sketches, but it's not totally done yet. But um, it, it's going to feature Ah Bing and the Bing Cherry and, and talk about and, and show his contribution to, to Milwaukee with that. Um, where the circles are now, he's going to take that out. And it's going to be more like a welcome to Milwaukee, kind of like a, like a vintage postcard style. And then um, he's also going to incorporate the Hadleys into it um, and talk about, you know, their contribution too to with their Milwaukee pastry kitchen and, and and really just kind of bring this whole sense of welcoming and inclusion and um, and just, you know it's just a really beautiful piece uh, can't wait for him to get started um, and he's a uh, he's kind of busy right now but luckily he's fitting us in and um, he's gonna start probably on September 1st with that work um, and yeah I think he's, he said he already met two of the neighbors there they're really excited they said they're super stoked to not have to look at a you know a plain white wall anymore and they can look at a nice mural so we're happy for that too and uh Hamid you want to talk about the love rocks yeah yeah uh, just one more thought on Jeremy Yokai Davis um I, I think it's important to note that he is a, a artist of of uh, uh of the BIPOC community and uh and the arts community is really wanting to to promote um black artists and people of color in their work uh we're gonna look for ways to do that more can i ask before you move on um when the haberman mural was done there was some kind of a sealant that was put over it to try to preserve it is that being done on these murals too yeah uh, we've yeah. already talked yeah to them and, and that's part of their contract too is that they need to put um, a sealant and then an anti-graffiti coating on it too to make sure that if, if it does for some reason get tagged they can be cleaned off easily Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, Milwaukee Love Rock. 
this is this is another tie-in to Hidden Hearts Milwaukee. Um, folks who just want to be creative during this time, and I feel like. Uh, folks who don't even consider themselves artists are really getting involved. So people have been painting on rocks and we've encouraged folks to leave rocks all around the grounds of City Hall and encouraging other folks to find a rock that makes them happy and take it home or to leave a rock. And uh, it's it's sort of amazing. I, I see folks reporting that they've, they're putting out dozens and dozens of rocks and I'll stop by and find a whole bunch and I'll stop by another time and I'll find four of them. So people have been actually engaged with this and, and finding their rocks and, and bringing them home and uh, or maybe that putting them somewhere else around town. I, I we don't really know, but uh, it's been a really fun way to get uh, the community involved in making art. And uh, I just I just feel that's so important for everyone to have uh, a way to express themselves, especially during these very interesting times. Um, and so right now we have our call for sculptors open as we normally do. Um, uh, this is, but this one is actually for four sculptures instead of three and uh, three will go in at City Hall and one will go into Dogwood Park. Um, it's open until August 31st. So um, if you know anybody that is a sculptor and you want to pass along the information for us, that, that would be great. Um, we've had a few people already reach out and uh, we're expecting to have a pretty good pool this time uh, as we normally do. Um, yeah, so we're excited for that. Uh, they should be um, going up uh, around October 1st. Um, so uh, the committee will take a few weeks to review and then make their decision. And uh, yeah, installation will probably the first week of October. And now to the, the main event that uh, Hamid will tell you all about. Porch Fest. We're having a Porch Fest, folks. Um, so the Arts Committee started talking about Porch Fest before COVID hit. And uh, once things, once we got into the thick of the pandemic, um, we started looking for ways to uh, actually make it happen. And we, what was really important was to get folks involved and out and about, but also not gather hundreds of people in one spot because that just wouldn't be safe. So we tried to look for a way to put on a citywide event uh, that um, uh, that can maintain social distancing. Um, so Porch Fest was born and it's, it's come about very, very quickly, uh, but it's starting very soon. It's actually starting this Friday and will be uh, this Friday and the next three Fridays after uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. We're encouraging folks to come out and make music on their porch and or their driveway or their yard or, or wherever. And uh, folks can email us and let us know where they're going to be and a little something about their music, like uh, there might be a, a banjo playing in the Llewellyn neighborhood or, uh, or a, maybe a bagpiper in Hector Campbell. Uh, there's an interactive map that folks can go to and, uh, and so they can look around their neighborhood and plan their own walking or biking route uh, around their own neighborhoods and to listen for, to all of these audio wayfinding points to uh, make them maybe smile and dance and maybe get inspired. Um, let's see, so there's going to be all kinds of performers uh, across the city, some professional, some not so professional, and we're encouraging everyone with a, a kazoo and a tuba and a trombone to come on out and uh, make some noise and we're even encouraging folks to if dancers want to come out um, there may be even a, like a comedy improv happening at Chapel Theater um, and our, our very rare occasion I get to play some music at a Milwaukee event I'm usually taking pictures um, but I'm gonna play music on the first and third events in Island Station um, so we've uh, this was sponsored by the Llewellyn NDA. They put in $2,500 to kick off the idea, which was a, a fraction of their normal summer concert budget, uh, about half their summer concert budget. But since uh, our NDAs could not put on the summer concerts, we decided to join forces and create this, um, this kind of 
this this idea. Um, and Porchfest is not our own idea. There are Porchfests that go on all over the country, um, but the folks who originated Porchfest have just encouraged others to just do it and make it your own. So that, that's what we're doing. Uh, so I hope you all wander around your neighborhoods and look for some music. So Hamid, um, last I heard, you had some musicians who were looking for venues. Like I'm offered my porch for musicians. Are there still the need for additional porches for, you have more musicians than porches? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the ratio of porch to musician is. <laughs> But uh, Samantha Swindler of the Arts Committee is uh, is trying to match up porches to musicians, and uh, so uh, we're encouraging anyone with a porch or anyone with a who wants to play music to contact us if they don't have a location in mind, and, and we can try and help facilitate that. Um, also, something I, I didn't mention: we are um, part of our budget is to. Uh, is to pay some artists and we are featuring a um, a performance per week uh, so every week we'll have a uh, a featured performer and we're partnering with Willamette Falls Studios and they're gonna come out to each location each week to help us live stream the event so um, so we'll be live streaming one performer per week uh, doing about a 45 minute 50 minute set or so um, so we can reach folks who maybe can't get out and about and, um, and are still needing to connect in some nice community ways. Is that just live streaming on Willamette Falls or is it live streaming on Facebook too? Um, so we're taking, Willamette Falls Studios will be live streaming to their YouTube account and, um, we have some technical ways to get that live streamed onto the Arts Committee's Facebook page. Um, so it'll be streaming in a couple places simultaneously. Right. Um, and, we're, and we're hoping the city will, will share those links as well so we can reach as many folks as possible. I think we can make that happen. Yeah. Hooray. So, I mean, tell us all again how, uh, how people will find these musicians. So uh, we've created a, a website um, it's milwaukeeporchfest.com um, on there is a map and you can pull up the map on your computer or your smartphone or tablet and there is a different tab for each of the four dates so you can pull up the August 21st dates and see all the different places um, that people are playing uh, it, at least like the, the intersection or, or close to where they're playing uh, as well as a, a brief description, and we we're trying not we're trying to keep it um, like a little bit unclear in a way. Like we, if there's a an artist that might be a big draw, we don't exactly want to say like, oh, here's this big band that's going to be like right here because we don't want fans to like really gather to a, a place and 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 potentially get a little too close. Um, so we're we're keeping those descriptions a little general, like. Um, Oh, there's like a rock band here, or old time banjo, or a brass quintet. Um, so we're keeping those things a little general, but the folks will be able to uh, see a, see a map. And then the day of, we're gonna try and print like print a um, like a list um, of all the different locations with all that information. So all of that will be available on our social media and uh, and also on the Milwaukee Porch Fest website. And there'll be some signs too, right? I mean, that will be in the performer's yards. Oh, that's right. Yes, we um, part of our budget was to create some, some yard signs. So uh, with the Porch Fest logo on it and the website uh, uh, URL on it as well. And so, uh, if all goes well, we'll be um, getting those out to locations on Thursday. Uh, and also, we're, we've got some limited edition t-shirts that are being made as well. Um, Gabe Storm created our logo, and I just think he did a fantastic job on it. So I think I'll make really great t-shirts. 
Um, that, that's actually our uh, presentation and our update today. But um, Hamid and I are happy to answer any questions you might have about this or anything else. No, great job. Yeah, great. Um, way, to, way to pivot for pandemic. No kidding. The website looks great. Yeah, it's really fantastic to hear all of this. And it's so innovative and inclusive and just all around great ideas. I mean, you guys have come a long way and it's, it's just really fantastic. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a true honor to serve our community. It's a joy. Well, thank you. Very cool. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let me pull back up. Um, our next item is a discussion of uh, about the Dogwood Park Framework Plan, and this will be led by uh, Kelly Brooks. Hi. Okay, let me share my screen here. The screen sharing isn't working. Hold on. I believe in you, Kelly. I know you can do this. I know. You say that every time. It's because I've seen you do it. <laughs> it does work. All right, hold on. Okay. Um, am I sharing now? Yeah. You are. Oh, my gosh. So exciting every time. Okay. Um, all right. So let me see if I can get it to start. And I did actually try to embed some things in here, <laughs> which may or may not work. Um, okay. So um, I'm just going to start by telling you why we did a Dogwood Park um, framework plan. Uh, much of it's covered in the staff report, but we did have a 2011 concept plan, a diagram, but it wasn't necessarily addressing some of the things that we were being that were asked being asked of us a lot. We had some requests that were coming in from the um, from CMI, the farmers market, because they were thinking about their move to the plaza area and trying to sort through where they would have performance space, where they could potentially add some additional storage space and they were asking us how the park could fit into that and we were like it's a small park we don't know um we also had a new plaza uh that we needed to really fully integrate and understand how it interfaced with the the park and then we also knew that coho was coming and that we had this future bike connection and this integration of the park and then the right away and then the development so we had a lot of different things going on and in conversations with layla and ncprd we decided that it would be good if we could just do a little planning effort and by little i mean little so we spent twenty thousand dollars ten thousand dollars from the city and ten thousand dollars from ncprd uh, to contract with kurt lango who um, is um, who, who's worked with the city in the past but who's doing the landscape architecture work on the coho project so we wanted to to blend those two things together it seemed to make the most sense uh, and so we pulled together a quick scope and um, and brought them in. The other thing that we we wanted to be able to have is some sense of cost, um, and that's what we get here too, is sort of a planning level estimate for the different elements. Um, so here's the 2011 plan. It's half the 2011 plan, and this is where, if I click on it, I think it will open the whole thing. Do you see the whole thing? Let's see if I can zoom out here. I don't know why we're getting the next slide. You, your slide would be bigger. Oh, you got the next slide? Yeah, we've got two. We've got two side by side. Yeah, we're not in like the presentation mode. We're in like your You're notes nice. view. Hmm. Okay. I don't know how to fix that, guys. Let's see. I'm going to. What do you see now? Still same thing. Same thing. Can you tinker with display settings up top? Does that help? Potentially. You know what finally happened is I got a second monitor. Mm. And now it's on the wrong monitor. 
Is that better? Hey. Hey. Nice work. Me? Okay. Um, okay, so <laughs> let's see if this works now. All right. It's not that. Does this open up the bigger diagram of the 2011? Are you seeing it scroll? Yes. So this is what, yeah, this is what we started with. Um, and I just am showing it to you. We're not going to spend much time on it. Um, but it it includes a lot of the elements that remain, which is we know we, we have um, the art that we need to integrate. We knew that there needed a path connection. We heard the same issues that we heard this time around shade, um, and that shade continues to be an issue. Uh, but this is where we started from. Um, but I'm not going to spend much more time on that because the important thing for you to see is the next one. So here's the aerial. You guys are all familiar with this park. It's teeny tiny. I think it's 0.75 acres. It's actually two parks, really, like two pocket parks. <laughs> um, so we have the southern end and we have the northern end. Um, and what makes the most sense to me is this was attached to your um, to your staff report, so you've seen it. But just to actually walk through it because Kurt did a good job. Um, and if he were still under contract, I'd have him present this to you and it would be better, but you got me instead. Uh, so you got a little overview of the park, which I've already done. Um, the way we did outreach for this one is we made it PARB focused. So um, PARB was sort of the center of the, of the committee that we used. And then we, re we reached out to the arts committee and we reached out to historic um, NDA and brought them in. We also brought in um, the we brought Dave Ashenbrenner in from the farmer's market, and then we reached out to Sunshine Daycare because the, one of the other major elements that we'd heard um, was from Sunshine Daycare saying, hey, we have kids. We don't have anywhere to play. They actually, by state law, I think, are not allowed to cross 99E. So even when we have the future build out of the play space at 99E, it still doesn't work for the age group that she has at the preschool. Um, and downtown, they just, so they had got a grant and they were trying to find a way to incorporate some kind of play space. Uh, so she was participating in the conversations as well. So we brought them together. Um, they did, in, Kurt did individual stakeholder meetings uh, with those folks. Uh, and then we had an initial workshop where we brainstormed different concepts and then came back and refined those concepts in a second workshop. Uh, it took about three months. It was a pretty quick, pretty quick process. Um, I've touched on a lot of these things already, um, but we heard, again, just wanting to have overflow space, green space, just for people that are in the market or need somewhere to be, somewhere to eat. So don't develop it all, I guess. You know, it's small. Don't make it smaller. Um, we did talk about the dogwood trees. Um, so from the parks board perspective, uh, there's not a ton of love around dogwood you know, the dogwood tree as a species, but the park is named dogwood. So they settled on, okay, at least have one, you know, at least a dogwood. Um, but we really care about the oak tree that's already there. We want to protect that. Um, but they said, okay, let's, let's try to keep one, at least one dogwood tree um, was sort of where they settled on that one. Um, they wanted to make sure that you were preserving and protecting any overlook areas and viewing areas. Uh, they wanted more, again, they, if we could have seating, that overflow concept about how, where are people going when they're at the market was really important to them. Shade, um, if we can get you know a drinking fountain. Part of that comes from conversations we've had here at this council about, okay, next time we're in Dogwood Park, it'd be great to have a drinking fountain with water bottle refilling stations so that folks can have access to that. Um, so we had that in, in there as well. Um, in terms of the design considerations, we wanted it to be able to integrate not only with the plaza and the festival street, but that's a continuation of, um, of the connector and how all that flows together. Um, and we know we one day want to have a bike connection uh, to an undercrossing. Um, so how's all that going to work? How, does, how, how are you connecting these two pocket parks together and, and then to other uh, bike connections throughout the city? Um, so that, those are, again, those are the main elements. Um, so this is sort of showing you how it is today. Um, we have uh, an existing trail. Um, we have um, the art that's now, that's already, I think actually that's the, the tree, 
but we have an existing sculpture there that actually Jordan was just talking about. You can see from the Tobo, this is just crazy steep. If you've been there, you know. So just drops right off. Um, so we have a lot of grade issues. Um, but you start to get over here in this five area. So to the future multimodal pathway that's in, you know, envisioned. So trying to get people to understand Kelly, right away. Yeah. We're still on the framework plan overview slide. So we, we're not looking at the numbered version just yet. Hmm. Okay. Sorry guys, hold on. You're still on this, the aerial map? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, we're gonna do something different, y'all. I am gonna stop, I'm gonna stop this share and I'm just gonna pull up the framework plan. Kill my PowerPoint slide. So hold on one sec. Hey Scott, can you pull up a t the 11 by 17 attachment oh. that was in the staff report? And you want me to share my screen? Please. Okay, hold on. Well, he's working on that. Yeah. I'm curious, were the conversations structured so that people were also thinking that someday this won't be a lake, this will be a creek, and that it will, in essence, be connected to the other side of the lake, to the other side of the light rail and, and train line, where there's that little sort of no man's land piece of property right now? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I think it's hard for people to envision the future state. It was definitely discussed and it was an underpinning element of the planning process to say that the, the, the one day this is supposed to be um, rehabilitated and different. Um, but in terms of, and we have a lot, if you go to, can I go to the next page? Um, this doesn't quite answer your question, Mayor, but we looked at all the different overlay. This is just a patchwork of overlays um, and different restrictions. So we had, there was one, it was the really expensive version, which I'm not gonna show you, which ultimately shows like a, almost like a bridging element. My understanding is you still need some kind of bridging element if you're gonna formally connect the two, even after we drain the lake. Um, so, you know, we did have some kind of grander scale ideas, um, but in terms of getting into the knowing exactly where the water levels are going to be and how all this will work together it mainly just stayed up and it stayed out of the, the steep areas of the site so the uh the kellogg tra kellogg path bridge doesn't technically connect them enough it would have to be at creek level are you talking about the the dotted line that's going down to the, the future underpass no, no, uh, that part I get. Okay. And maybe I didn't understand what you were saying that even w when there's just a creek, you're going to need some connecting. I believe even in, in a, and I could be wrong, but I believe even in a future state where you've, you've drained the lake, um, due to the elevation between, um, the two, the two pocket parks, you still, if you were going to come out, you could do a bridging structure there. You can, you can, we're winding. I'll show you what it looks like in terms of the path connection without that. Um, but it didn't, it didn't address, I guess maybe your question is, and tell me if I'm wrong. It didn't address how to get from the top of the park down. Is that what you're asking? I, I wasn't, uh, okay. but yeah, I, I can understand that. I mean, right now, the the one that's sort of there is the one that goes down into the trees mm -hmm. with the little uh, log steps and everything. It gets you pretty close to the lake level. 
We very intentionally didn't. We said that that would be a part of the planning effort around the restoration effort for the, the lake. Okay. That we would tackle that then. Is that? Sure. Okay. I, yeah. Um, Scott, can you go to the next page? Can you guys make that bigger? Like, can you make there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Because this is still existing conditions, right, Scott? Uh, sure. Can you get me to do, um, I'm sorry to do this to you, but my way wasn't working. Um, that's the last page, which is the farmer's market. There's one before it that is the proposed elements and where they are. That's the cost estimate. That's the farmer's market. The one right before. This must be it. I think this is it. This yeah. is it. Okay. So, um, yes, thank you. You can come down on. So, um, we did identify the need for a as continuous as a of a pathway as we could get, some similar um, to to which is the one, which is the line. You'll you'll see that we are using existing sidewalk there um, for part of it because like we didn't pick the bridge option because it was really expensive uh, we're keeping the sculpture basically where it is um, and we're keeping a lot of the lawn space down there in uh, three in the south parcel um, but we did incorporate um, some amount of nature play in that in that southern parcel now this this is TBD what this would be um, it could be just sort of some sort of large boulders it's not gonna look like a playground necessarily but what we heard from sunshine daycare is if you could just get us something where we can use large motor skills just something um so we we spent a lot of time talking about whether or not there's room for play and settled on bringing it here there were concerns about bringing it here which i'm just gonna share um it's this is more remote so there's like some safety issues about like having it be this far away oh if you're if people wanted to play you know but it just it, it, when we were trying to balance all the elements, um, this is where that play space ended up. Uh, we did keep one dogwood tree. Lisa, Katie, um, I know you wanted to talk about dogwood, but there is one dogwood tree shown. Um, I think your con the concerns that I had heard and have heard about, is this the right species necessarily that we want to be propagating within the city for our tree goals? I 100% hear you. The reason why this tree is here is because the park is named. Um, uh, dogwood and we were trying to respect the fact that um, the dogwood trees had been intentionally planted there um, I believe as a part of Arbor Day at one point but um, so that that's why the dogwood tree is there uh, we kept the overlook at seven which is over there closer to um, uh, the uh, right away where Adams Street um, is where that lo is located um, the plaza is just referenced here um, next to that's a kind of an integrated space with the coho development so there'll be an additional and again layla can speak more smartly to how that's going to play out but we just wanted it on the plan to show that there's this space that's going to be um, both part of the coho development and interacting with dogwood as well um i think that is it we kept so the, mm -hmm. on the adam street right of way there's a dotted is that like, I mean, I know we were, we're going to lose, we're going to have a steeper grade and stuff. There's a grade issue there. So is that what is anticipated is how a path is going to have to go to maintain ADA compliance? Is that what that That's is? That's purely illustrative. Okay. Um, so, and this is where I kind of, I'm, you're getting me, the non-planner, showing you a plan because you're about to go into more conversations about COHO, and I just want you to have this information, but Layla knows and has been a part of this too. Um, so in terms of the next steps with how that's all going to work with cut and fill and future path alignment, they're still working on that. So this is really illustrative. So I wouldn't get too attached to it would wind just like that. Um, but that is where it would need to be, and it's a tight space. And we are expecting to have to do a lot of switchbacks. So. You would have to to fit it in that space if you did it this way. Yeah, yeah. most definitely. Um, uh, okay, is there anything else on here I didn't, did I touch, did I say all the numbers? I think I did. 
Okay. So you can go to the next page. The one thing that really kind of was a stumbling block, I would say, in our conversation was people just were like, we don't know what to do because we don't know what the market's going to look like here. And you keep asking us how we're going to interact with this space. And the main way we're going to interact with the space is with the market. And, and so what we did, we, when we got to that point in the conversation, I just went back, actually rescoped the contract with Kurt a little bit. And I said, give me a diagram that shows me the market and shows me the plaza and shows me the development and shows me how, shows us how all of this fits together. And then when we did that, we could also go in and reflect two of the elements that we'd heard from CMI that really the park's too small. We weren't figuring out a way to put them, but we can reflect that we would envision having the stage location right up by the, the post office as it's shown on the diagram for the market and that we would they had identified some additional storage space I think over in the right hand corner there's a small box um, that you can see that over um, uh, yeah you can I can't point to you but you it's over there so we identified the storage and the stage outside of the park and put it on this diagram so that you can see it um, and this, I think for me was also just, let's just get it down. You know, I, mean, I like to write things down. Like let's just have a diagram of how this could all function so everyone could see it. And it, and it helped, um, I think just bring the conversation to a close, um, a little bit better. So that's why this is in here. Um, it, it does serve the plan, but more importantly, I think it serves the, the city, um, just to see it all laid out in one place. Cause I would get questions and we had sort of old diagrams that we used but nothing kind of current that had all the elements and is this a, a schematic that the markets bought off on Dave was a part of it so I think I still have questions about how um, I think so I think we have more discussions to have about the market and their move down here. But that was the that was my intention, Councilor Brady, is that this is the this is the schematic that we worked with and we worked with the market to help us put it down. So but, it's um, been years yeah. since I was on the market board, um, yeah. so I am not in the loop on the latest conversations. But I even recall drawings that had fewer rows across that they were concerned they were concerned about wouldn't fit. I mean, yeah. if these are 10 by 10, you're saying we've got 50 feet across plus we got 70 feet to work with to have two aisles and five across. I, I mean, I don't know. I just know that there was a lot of concern a year ago uh, when we when we initially thought about moving down here, we thought we got to go all the way to the trestle when we learned that we have to keep that close to the post office. There was a lot of concern that we couldn't get enough vendor space and that they would need either the Bloom parking lot or Dogwood, some space in Dogwood or both to be able to get enough vendors and get, uh, you know, music and seating areas, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, this type, yeah, to me, I'm not sure that, that, that they're buying off on this, but maybe they are. Uh, it's really Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a question about this. Doesn't show any any real any vendors on the Adam Street connector. Is that not a possibility? If there is the need for more space, that seems logical to me. But maybe I'm not thinking of something. No, I think you're. I think you're. Um, that's a logical question, and I don't know. I think this was where. I asked and Kurt, and I know he did reach out directly to CMI to talk it over with them, but if there's additional, number one, the feedback's really good, which is why it looks tight to me. It looks like maybe they might have concerns, so you should check again, which I will do. Um, and then also, um, uh, Councilor Faulkner, yes, it, I mean, there's space there. Um, so could you have vendors? I think what you don't have right there necessarily are the plugins, so the water and electrical hookups that you have down in the plaza that a lot of those vendors would want. Um, but that's certainly a follow-up conversation I can have about what types of uses potentially could spill over up into the connector. Um, you also do have the, the hard, the new hard space down closer to the park. Um, that's that orange triangle looking space that we're not showing anyone on either. Um, so my guess is, and I can circle back with Kurt and ask, but he was attempting to keep it um, to the places where we have power and water hookups. I do believe there's some power in the Adam Street. There's no water, but I do believe 
tower under the little seats? Yeah, we had, um, when that was built out, we included it for music. We had thought that that may be a stage area for placing music. Right. And I thought when we had the sort of ribbon cutting, or maybe it wasn't the ribbon cutting, but we definitely have, we, I've definitely seen visuals before that had some tents on Adam Street connected with the farmer's market. Correct. When, we were, showing, when we were showing the plaza for that design, Councilor Faulkner, we actually had those going all the way up the Adam Street connector. Okay. Um, and I think part of this discussion is right now, because we haven't moved on the Harrison site, there's also not a, a huge amount of interest from CMI to, to worry about this quite yet. There's going to be a point where we have to worry about this. Uh, we don't know when that is, um, but it's still probably a couple of years out just based on where we are with the coho site and with other projects here in the city. Okay. I, I do appreciate it, and I think it just goes to, I didn't quite get my, like, gold star of like having a real document that everyone would appoint to and say, yes, this is what it looks like. I didn't quite get there. Um, and maybe I need to do a little more work on that to see if I can get it there. Um, but to Anne's point, less urgency than we had when this conversation began. So when we, when we first started, it was like, hey, we're moving down there and we don't know where we're going to store our stuff. Um, and we don't know where we're going to put the stage. And we, and so we're not there anymore. But um, I think I would like this to be something that everyone points to and says they agree. So I might go another round on this diagram in particular. Well, it is, it is also a, a $20,000 wire frame sort of yeah. project. So, it is a wire, it is a wire frame, you know. yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And I think that the conversation that was most important to have around Dogwood Park, specifically NCMI, is really, okay, we hear you, you want to leave green space as green space in the park so that it's available for people to hang out in and play in and um and relax in so i think i think you have achieved that goal um and my only question about it is did, is that enough shade really like there's a lot well, of space there well, i kind of definitely want to talk about trees yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no it's not um we talked, we did, we, and when we built the festival street, we, and we got to come back to this at some point, just need some more money. Um, we built the plaza so that you could incorporate vertical elements into it as well. And so we tried to get some shade there. I know there's some additional tree plant. There's, um, you know, we have two trees shown here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I agree. I hear, I, you know, it, the one that's picked is not a shade, a shade tree. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think shade is, is still a need, but we can address that need through something that's not shown here, which are the vertical elements, which you could do sun sails to over yep. the, over the street. I, I was thinking more in the green space. I, okay. I hear yeah. you were awesome. Yeah. So, um, I'd asked, um, staff to bring, uh, an assessment of dogwood trees as a habitat tree and I guess that's what Kelly was alluding to um like saying well we have to have a dogwood tree because it's called dogwood park um I actually think we should rename the park I actually think it should be Kellogg Creek Park or it should be Coho Point Park I think it's a it's a it's a water quality and habitat conservation area later tonight we're gonna we're going to um hopefully pass a uh comp plan that calls for us to create habitat corridors, uh, uh, wildlife corridors. I think um, having this have native plants uh, is important. Um, more so, I'm not saying we never plant another dogwood tree in Milwaukee, but I don't think this is a place we should be planting dogwood trees, actually. We're, we're adjacent to the creek and we're adjacent to what already has a couple of nice oaks back there and we should be expanding the oak woodland or planting other native plants and, and creating the potential for a better, healthier wildlife corridor once the lake is gone. So I actually think we ought to think about renaming it. Um, and not planting 
Retreat. Yeah, we didn't talk about we didn't talk about renaming it. Um, I hear you. I think you make a compelling case. What kind of a uh, process would we need to go through to do that? Um, I'm just kind of curious what you know what you think that would look like. I do believe it would run back through PARB. Sure. Um, they would rename it. I don't know from a planning perspective what kind of additional steps I would need to, to take with them, but I think it would largely be a PARB process, but it would need to be, um, just a full disclosure, it's not something I could probably do soon. Um, just because we would need to engage a lot bigger, you know, a pretty big group of folks and it would take some time to work through it. And there was, I will just say, there is some attachment to um, the name and the, the tree. So they were willing to go down to one, but um, they still like, there's some connection to it too. Just, I just want to say that that came through some of the conversations I had with, with Parb. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think I hear you. Um, I don't well, know that anything. We recently renamed Milwaukee Bay, and it really, right. that's a much bigger park, and it wasn't really that much process. I don't it was. Uh, we actually was, had to go through the it NDA. It was a process, actually. And, and I think, unless I'm remembering this totally wrong, anytime we rename something like that, we also have to go through NCPRD's District Advisory Board. Correct. So it's in our IGA. And we had to do that with Milwaukee Bay Park. And if I recall, I think the whole Milwaukee Bay Park thing took like six or eight months or something. It did. Uh, and it took Mitch a significant amount of time. So yeah. it was uh, the NDA, it's the PARB, and it's the um, N uh, NCPRD. And there's like uh, public hearings involved, I think, for at least two of those three. It, it is a significant process if we want to go down this path. I'm actually not trying to dissuade us from going down the path from the perspective of if it, if I don't, the name doesn't have a personal attachment, I think, for me or for, for Kelly, but it is a significant process. So I have two comments about this. One is there, there is already a Milwaukee, or I'm sorry, there is already a Kellogg Creek Park. That's what we call the stretch along the sewage treatment. <laughs> Wes calls it. It's not called that on any of our maps. Uh, it is a publicly known name. Yeah. I'll, that's, we'll leave that. The other thing is um, when we're thinking about this park, I don't, uh, I don't know what the history is around that name. I don't know what it means to, to park or, or any of that. So I'd be curious to know that before um, we, we get super excited about changing the name because it may, it may be named that for something that's really special to people we care about. Mm -hmm. I was going to point out, so, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know, I, mean, I don't know the history of Kellogg either, but I imagine it's just someone's name, um, probably a property owner. So, you know, I'm, yeah, if, if that's the case, then I think that, it, you know, that should just be something that, you know, during a public process that gets considered and weighed and whether or not that's something we want to move forward, you know, I'd be more, I guess, you know, personally inclined to something like Coho Point or something that really celebrates the desire for the, you know, ultimately, you know, that area, which is to return to a, you know, a fish supporting stream. Um, I guess I would like to maybe just sort of inject a little bit of, uh, you know, about the planting um, and reserving so much grass, you know, in, you know, in the HQAW, all the acronyms. Um, in such a, in a habitat that we are trying to, you know, eventually get um, support for restoring with the removal of, of the dam. Um, you know, I, I do sort of hear what Councillor Beatty is saying, um, and it, it makes me think that if we wanted to take an approach, you know, a planting approach that was a lot more, um, a lot more geared toward making that an even, you know, a stronger habitat for wildlife, I think that that could potentially help us in our um, convening and influencing and 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 you know um, persuading much more powerful and deep pockets uh, than we have um, to to maybe maybe lift the removal of Kellogg Creek Dam um, up in the ranks. I think that there are tons of competing projects out there for. For, for money, um, and I wonder if you know if this if this if we were to establish, you know, more supportive landscaping around this area, you know, would that help in 
in our, you know, in our, in our efforts to try to get uh, more support for, for that project. We could call it No Damn Park. <laughs> I'm I'm talking more well, now about I'm talking more now idea. about native planting than I am renaming the park. I mean, so we've established that there's a whole process here, but I'm wondering if you know was was parks even you know were we thinking about this when this sort of planting scheme was being discussed? That you know that here we have this project that's been sort of like out there, not really on you know it's it's it's. You know, we've, there's some little grants for studying it and things like that that are, you know, kind of trickling in. And Kelly, you know way more about this process than I do. But it seems like, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here to elevate it and to and to put some money where our mouths are and create better habitat. With own, We own this property. We could, you know, that would be real, like a real commitment that the city could show to who, I don't know who has the money. ODOT, DFW, you know, DSL, all the state agencies that would need to be, con you know, DEQ convened to distribute that money for removal of this dam. Um, I'll just, if I can jump in, I think, well, number one, if it's no dam park, I think we don't need a process at all. It'll just take <laughs> two days. I think I can get that done. Um, but with, to your point, um, uh, Council President Falconer, I hear you. I, do, I think we, and I, I would say this group didn't spend time really thinking about how to leverage funds for the restoration of Kellogg Creek. Um, it was just outside the scope. Um, I do think about that kind of thing. Um, and there are, I wish I could sit you down with Tessie, um, but you know, who would love to just get out there and start pulling, pulling out invasives and planting things that will create shade one day, like want to do it like now. Um, and I think to your point, but that is lower down and I'm going to let the mayor and Councillor Beatty who are actually smarter on this than I am ecologically, like this area, this is, this is high, um, where a lot of that work really needs to happen is lower so we can create cool the water, um, so that it actually would be a space that fish can, can be in, um, after the dam comes out, you can do a lot of work down at that level. And a lot of that has been on hold and continues to be on hold for all sorts of um, some sound, some not sound reasons. It's um, toxic. Um, it's you don't know exactly where things are going to be, but I think there is some conversation we could have about what interim or near term steps could you be taking to make this a better habitat one day, right? I, I hear you. I don't think for this area um, there's much there. There, I guess I'll just say I don't know that that what you would do up here in Dogwood's going to leverage that. I think the conversations about showing the future path connection is a, is is prompting some of that leverage to say, hey, we want to make a connection, and we're showing that here in this plan that we think these that these things fit together. I think that does some of what you're talking about more so than like um, than uh, planting in this in this space. And what I did hear is it's more. Um, that the human overflow from the market in particular was the top of mind um, concern for at least the folks that participated in the conversations that we had. But I do think there are other steps that you could be taking potentially that would do some of what you're talking about, which is how could you be investing in some habitat restoration down lower um, that would signal to our friends at ODF and W and other places that we're here doing the work, we're ready for you to show up, um, yeah, time. I mean, I guess, you know, yeah. part of the, you know, part of the issue, I think, with, with the Kellogg Dam, right, is that it's, you know, it, the way that it, I think it stacks up is that it's in such an urbanized, you know, sort of, it's surrounded by so much urbanized industrial area. And so, you know, anything that we can do to sort of offset that, obviously, we can't, you know, can't do a whole lot, you know, but we can, you know, we can control what gets planted there. And so when I see a whole lot of lawn, you know, I see what that opportunity is for families, you know, to gather, but I wonder if, you know, but then of course it also has to be maintained. And I've seen, you know, parks personnel out there, whoever is out there spraying, you know, for the existing grass we have. And, you know, all that stuff's washing right down into Kellogg Lake right now. And so I think that, um, you know, I, I mean, not to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure the mayor and Councillor Beatty know more about this stuff than I do, but I just see an opportunity here to, you know, to, to, to further, you know, to get that ribbon as dark green as possible around a creek. And I understand that shade is going to be closer 
to the water, but I also think that what happens you know, uphill from that is really important too. There's a lot of runoff that's going to be happening, you know, from the urbanized environment as well as the the lawn. So, I I think you're I think you're right, and I do think that the opportunity, the next opportunity, is to to do the grubbing to get rid of the blackberry, to start planting uh, trees on that slope, and I agree, tree, shade trees. Uh, you know, around the lawn, so that so eventually that's a shady lawn for people to enjoy their picnic at the market or whatever. Um, I think those are things we can be doing. The beauty of if if we can settle on a plan, so that then we know, okay, we have to do dirt work here, we don't have to do dirt work there, or we don't have to do dirt work. Let's get some trees in so that they can start growing. Mm -hmm. You know, let's grub out the blackberry. Let's get the trees, the low trees, down along that slope going, so that in 10 years that we have actual trees, not sticks. Um, I, that's, that's our near-term opportunity that I, I do think sends the message that we're serious about restoring this, uh, this area to be more conducive to a salmon-bearing stream. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I was just gonna say, I, I feel like that um, that represents a, a sort of a compromised position in some ways that I think is appropriate for this space because we do we have competing interests here, um, and and I think that the the concern or excitement, however you wish to paint it, uh, from the market folks around making sure that there's some space that's um, available for people to kind of stroll around and, and get a little breathing room. I think they need that, um, and I, I think that's a reasonable request. Um, putting some native shade trees in around so that they also have shade, which I have heard over and over from CMI, they, they really want shade, and certainly I go to the market, I want shade. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. When you start putting native plants underneath trees, you, you have a much more limited number of plants that you can actually utilize and the maintenance concerns are different and you don't have um you're not likely to have a space that is uh friendly for people to hang out in. you know you, grass one of the reasons we still have it is it serves that purpose now if there's a conversation to be had here about what kind of grass if we could do like a cool eco lawn installation that will never require spraying and requires a reduced amount of water usage and serves as a demonstration to folks for different ways to think about lawns. I think that could be pretty cool. Um, we have lawn seed companies that work in the Willamette Valley and have vendors in the Portland area that sell lawn seed mixes that are you know, no spray and pollinator friendly or whatever it is that you want. There's lots of different speeds, but I do think that we should we should be sensitive to the needs of the park and the public around this. That's, um, I, I know, oh, sorry. The eco lawn was the thing I was going to raise too, is I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I have some of that seed in my own lawn and I, I know the vendors who sell it. Um, I don't really know uh, how it holds up in a higher traffic area, and it'd be interesting to hear from NCPRD or maybe Peter knows. Um, but I mean, I think it's at least worth trying to find out if we could. Do there are it. some high, there's some high traffic mixes that are specifically designed for use in, in urban areas. Yeah. So I just so want I to also, I just want to pull back real fast, and Kelly's probably going to look at me and go. I was going to say that we actually had zero staff time committed to doing anything after this like nothing actually is scheduled to go on from here this was us making you aware as we're doing construction on coho that we did this to make sure we were being receptive to our community as they are doing some things so we don't negate future activities um so yes and i think that we're open to those possibilities moving forward this has been a great discussion but unless you all tell us that we're we're taking kelly and we're re-diverting her to other things uh, this is actually the closing of this discussion for us mm -hmm. is that okay until, until well, you're coho i think that yeah i think coho's development will start triggering some conversations but even at that a lot of the conversations that we've had even tonight 
are things that would be implemented by others like NCPRD or um, partners that we have or people we would be able to get cash from. I think that that's still a great idea. And now that we have it in our head, we can look for those opportunities. But right now, this isn't something that we're planning on taking any further, unless Kelly tells me I'm wrong, but I don't think she's gonna tell me that. No, oh, no, I was gonna go into the, thank you for your feedback and I'm sorry, but I have to adjust expectations part of the meeting just because I don't have um, many ways yeah. to to um, to do some of the bigger things uh, right now, just for this, because it was such a teen, teeny tiny endeavor. And I know I normally am here talking about things that have budgets, uh, bigger budgets, but we only have $75,000 in the CIP total um, for Dogwood. Um, right now, and if you look at the back page, that's um, not quite enough. I wanted to be able to um, answer CMI's questions about could they store things, could they have staged. That was one thing that we wanted to do. And I, I did want to try to get back to Sunshine Daycare because um, they've been seeking grant funding to try to get some play space, and we were trying to figure out if there's a, a, something we could do for them. So this gives me a place um, that maybe we can form some of those partnerships and then the next implementation um, partner we have is, you know, is the development which, you know, Layla's working on. So there could be elements that could move through that. But I do hear you. And I don't think that one day you can't rename the park. And I, 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 think, you, I think you could have that conversation. I just want to be real frank that I, I can't start it right now. And I think some of these bigger conversations that you want to have are tied to the bigger um, Kellogg Creek restoration effort. Uh, which would be a, you know, a tens of million dollar um, process, which could probably bring a lot of things along for the ride. Um, that might not be a bad time to rename. Um, so I think there's, I think there's ways um, to incorporate your feedback and I do appreciate it. And I appreciate hearing from you, um, the feedback on the market layout in particular. Um, but yeah, I, it, it, I'm gonna close out on Dogwood for a minute um, now that I've, I've shared it and passed it um, uh, along to uh, Layla's team. I think you've got a lot of good work done with twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All righty then. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? Oh, I will just add. The question was asked about the history, and Scott may know, but my my sense is uh, the park was probably built in two thousand three when the it was the centennial and they were planting dogwoods around town. They were trying to plant 100 dogwoods for the centennial, and I suspect that's when this park was sort of founded. Um, but I don't know that for sure. That's speculation on my part. That sounds familiar to me. I'd have to look more into it to confirm that. I feel like Amy may have pulled something like this for us before, but I'd have to She did, it. and we can go back and grab that, Scott. So just out of curiosity, the tree that's there is, I take it, not the native dogwood, it's the eastern dogwood. Oh no, they're Korean dogwoods. That's what they planted for the, Korean. they're Kusa Korean dogwoods, yeah. yeah. The ones that bloom later. Mm -hmm. Okie doke. All right, anybody else, anything else? In that case, we are adjourned until six. Uh, for the regular session.